at NRIC Hyderabad. He obtained PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India in 1992. He visited USC for six months on broadcast fellowship. He worked as visiting professor in Ecole National University, France. His research in the interests include climate hydrology, water resources systems, climate change, impact on water resources. He has published more than 150 papers in leading international journals and conferences. He has co-authorized two textbooks, Multi-Criteria Analysis, Hydraulic Pipe Modeling. He is Associate Editor in ASC Journal of Hydrologic Engineering, Institution of Engineers and Indian Society for Hydraulics. He is member of AGU, ASC, IAHS and Indian Society of Remote Sensing. Now I invite Professor B. Nagesh Kumar to deliver keynote address. Give me more uh, kind of a basic aspects of how we can try to use uh, remote sensing, GIS, and DM for water source assessment. Um, so, if you are already familiar with it, please bear with me. It's like a reputation because I see many students, so hopefully, for uh, sake of students, uh, it should be interesting. Uh, how much time I Uh, you know, a panoramic view of a large area in one image and that gives us a very good input to analyze a large portion of a region comfortably. So what you are seeing is actually entire India and its surroundings in a one snapshot like thing. And here we are trying to see a large number of regions within like whatever the number of states that we are seeing in India and many other places. But the kind of color that you are seeing here is interesting, you know. This is not typically what you would see if you are trying to apply over the gradient. This is referred to as a standard popular composite. So what you are seeing here in red color, please believe me, it is vegetation. So what we are going to do is that if we have this kind of information, what is it we can do from water source point of view or from hydrology point of view? Typically when we talk about EMR spectrum, we have a very large range of um, regions where we can do remote sensing and more importantly is this portion which is to which our human eye is sensitive which is referred to as visible region. Within this itself we have a number of spectral regions like this 0.4 to 0.5 would be one wavelength and apart from that we can do remote sensing in many other wavelengths but we can't see them with our naked eye so we try to give some kind of fast color to them to prepare a pulse color composite. That's why we see them as pulse color composite. For example, if we have some image acquired in this reflected infrared region, we try to give it some pulse color to produce an image from that. So when we want to talk about remote sensing uh, images, these are the four important characters we typically look for. One is the spatial resolution, which basically talks about what is the smallest elementary area over which we make an independent observation. That's something like, if you say that it is 30 meter spatial resolution, you are referring to 30 meter by 30 meter square box, you are seeing as one dot on the image or a pixel in the image. So you can see on the left hand side of the image, for illustration, this is covering a city and its uh, neighborhood. So it's gradually goes to spatial resolution. When you look at this image, this is a very fine spatial resolution. You can see car parking area and the car coming into parking area to be parked and so on. So depending on spatial resolution, you can see detailed information of the region that they are interested in. The next aspect that is also equally important is spectral resolution. For example, if you are trying to have one image in the entire visible region that I have shown you, 0.4 to 0.7, we refer to a panchromatic image. Instead of that, a pan image, if you try to like slice that itself into so many spectral bands, we can have uh, multi-spectral images, which will have very fine spectral resolution. For example, this may be 0.3 micrometer spectral resolution, and this may be 0.1 micrometer spectral resolution. Therefore, we can talk about multi-spectral images. Like this. Here, what you are seeing is uh, from uh, Landsat images. You can see for we have different wavelengths, how the image will look like. All the places that you are seeing the same region, but in different wavelengths, how it looks like. The 
plus uh, equally important aspect is radiometric resolution. That means once we have an image, and if you want to talk about in how many number of levels that we can write to the photograph, if you look at other black and white image, we have only simply response to the kind of black or white. Instead of that, if you try to record that as about let's say 256 gray levels or gray tones, then we talk about 8 bit data and we can talk about 2 bit data and so on and so forth. So 8 bit data will have more information than compared to 2 bit data. This is very common even now in your mobile cameras. You talk about um, high res images. So there you talk about how many pixels you have and what is the number of values that you can record per pixel and so on. And if you need to put all of them together, what you are seeing from hydrology point of view is, let us say that this is one basin. Okay. This entire basin is like, let us say, Ganga basin and surroundings. And within this basin, the entire basin, the image that is covered here is about 400 kilometers length. Okay. And that is typically of modis data. And compared to that, if you just take this small yellow box, that itself is an image here. And that is from Landsat EDM plus, that is Enhanced Thematic Mapper plus image. And so you can see that now it is only 200 kilometers that is covered here. And if you take this small yellow color box here, that itself is an image here in another sensor with a higher spatial resolution or iconos, where the color is only 11 kilometers. So if you just think that you want to have entire area of this with this kind of spatial resolution, you may have to have about thousands of images to cover this region. So depending on the area of interest and the proximity or the detail that we want to obtain, we can try to go for different spatial resolution images. And what is more important from satellite remote sensing point of view is that these images we try to acquire them at regular intervals of time. That is referred to as temporal resolution. So if you look at the advantage of temporal resolution, you can look at for changes in land use and power monitoring, temporal variation, monitoring of dynamic events like cyclone, flood, balcony, earthquake, etc. can all be monitored if we have the temporal resolution information available. One example for that is that we have an image here. This is the non flood here. The river is flowing like this. And when compared to that, if you look at this image, this is during flood period. And you can see the flood plain that is totally inundated, this portion. Okay. And this is the way it looks like if you are trying to fly over that region, that is true color composite. And compared to that, if you want to get more detailed information using multispectral data, we can try to provide this information. As I have mentioned to you earlier, if you see something in red color in a standard false color composite, you are referring to vegetation. So here you can see that there is a lot of vegetation in this area. Now all the vegetation is submerged. So this is the area that is flooded and because of that this entire area is now devastated due to flooding. And you can also see some urban area and that urban area is also inundated. So by temporal resolution of images like this, we can try to look at how things are changing over time and try to compare. For example, if you simply do compare these two images, we can find out how much area has come under inundation. Just to let this point home, what you are seeing here is the Krishna River Basin, entire Krishna River Basin. And on a bi-monthly scale from January, you can see how the land use land cover information is changing. See the amount of gravy here and that is lost in the summer and by the time you come to monsoon, most of the area is under vegetation. There are many rivers in this Krishna river basin uh, like Tumbagra, Bhadra and other things and now there are many, about 18 major reservoirs. So the entire project is shown in one image here. Uh, please remember the shape of it, I will come back to it again. Now we can try to use this remote sensing in various domains. Uh, I will just rush through this. We can try to uh, make rainfall estimation using remote sensing. There are many satellites available only for this purpose. Uh, especially uh, if you talk about this last satellite that mentioned here, KRMM, which is very good as far as rainfall measurement is concerned. And it provides information. As a matter of fact, many people call this KRMM as uh, rain gaze in space because normally rain gaze will be there on the ground. And as these range is almost like range in space and measures range for a very good uh, accuracy at the uh, entire uh, tropical basis. I mean, we don't get it for subtropical and beyond that. That's why it's tropical rainfall measurement mission. 
and we can also do it for the inform option. Basically, the information that we try to get here is the uh, land use land information, and we can try to get the physiographic measurements for uh, watershed planning and management. Many information like uh, stream model, stream length, etc. can be derived. I will try to go through these ten permits, and watershed degradation of uh, soil and land resources can be studied, like the uh, saline affected, alkaline affected, and even the uh, water level areas can be identified through most of them. Another tool that I will be using is uh, GIS. Basically, it's for uh, spatial database management. It is nothing but uh, extension of Excel file that you might be using. Excel is basically for uh, numerical database management. But if the numerical database has some spatial attributes, then we refer to it as uh, spatial database management. And if we try to put them through an RDBMS like uh, relational database management system, then we have a GIS. The GIS basically tries to deal with the uh, uh, various information that is available on the ground surface and we try to link them together to model and the advantage that we have with respect to water source assessment is uh, we try to use it in various stages. First of all, in the initial stage, we try to develop the database that is required for uh, water source assessment like uh, maybe simply some rainfall data or some maps that may be available. So we try to fully put all of them together, that is the initial stages, then technical information try to put some modeling components into it and then try to get the information from the topological network modeling etc. And finally at the end when we try to model the analogy using this database, then if we try to talk about presentation of that analysis, presentation of the data, uh, for visualization, again we use GIS, that is for knowledge presentation. In all these stages, GIS plays a very important goal. Uh, this is one uh, such uh, model which is actually used before GIS came into picture, AGNPS, which is a non-point solution model, was available. And there are many other models that came into picture. Um, I think I will run through this because I am not sure that I have time to do this. But I thought for the sake of students, I will briefly mention about uh, this particular tool which is also very popular called basal elevation model. Again, it is nothing but uh, in survey you might have got the elevation data and when you try to represent the elevation data on a computer system it is referred to as digital elevation data and when you try to model it, it is called digital elevation model. So, you know what you are seeing here is actually a ridge line, that is the watershed boundary line and you can also see a valley line that is the lowest point within the basin. So, these things can be derived easily through elevation data. So if we have elevation data, what we can do with the digital elevation data is we can like represent it in the form of uh, splines and smooth curves to show there are peaks here, there are valleys here and all that. But what we can do with the digital elevation data, and these are different ways in which we can represent, but what we can do with digital elevation data is we can try to derive the flow direction, flow pathways, flow accumulation, stream network, catchment area and upstream contributing area of each grid cell and so on and so forth. All that can be done with the simple <coughs> elevation information that is available. I will take about 3 4 minutes to explain how it can be done. So if we have elevation data, let us say that what you are seeing here is that 67 is elevation at this point and 56 is elevation at this point, 49 is elevation at this point with respect to some uh, benchmark, maybe reduced level or something like that. So if you know the if you know the elevation information at all these points, the next point is that you know if you see the elevation difference, you know what is the amount of elevation difference here, you know the elevation difference here. But you can also find out what is the slope, what is the slope in this direction, what is the slope in this direction, what is the slope in this direction. If you consider the unit distance, okay, slope is simply um, 67 minus 53 by 1, that is 14 percent. And if you consider this, it is the distance is square root of 1 plus 1, so 67 minus 1 plus 1, 16 by 1. If you look like this, from this point, in which direction we have the steepest slope? In that direction, if there is a water for rainfall falling occurring here, it will flow in the direction. So we try to identify what is the steepest slope. And if we do that, for every, for example, in this direction, let's say this is the steepest slope direction. And in this, this is the direction. Like that, if you try to put it, then we have the aeromarks identified like this. 
Now, if you have elevation information through the, if you can get this slope, steeper slope direction, then what we can do is we can see that this is coming and joining here, and from here it is moving like this. So, join all those lines, okay, we have the stream network. And from this stream network, we can also identify that you know this entire portion is draining into this. So this could be one subcatchment, this could be another subcatchment, and so on. So what we are trying to do is we just use the derivation data to derive the catchment map itself. So if we have the derivation data, from that we try to identify the flow path, and from flow path we try to talk about flow accumulation, and based on that we can see what is the main river what are the tributaries and things of that kind and also identify different colors, different subcatchments which are contributed. Okay. So from elevation data we can go up to catchment delineation starting from the entire detailed drainage structure. Only thing that we have to ask for is where is this elevation data available. <coughs> this elevation data is available from many multiple sources. One of them is referred to as a SRPM or Structural Data Topography Machine and the data that is available here is obtained through one technique that is referred to as a radar interferometry and the elevation data that is available from this source is available globally at the top for our country it is available at about 18 meter spatial elevation. That means for every 18 meter by 18 meter point we have elevation data available as far as our country is concerned from this SRPM data it is freely downloadable and you can try to utilize the for elevation data. So I can show that the data for this basin that Krishna Basin Karnataka and you can see how the elevation uh, data looks like. It looks like a very innocent black and white image. But what you are seeing here is actually this portion itself is one image and this is one more image. Like that all these images are fixed together to provide the entire uh, Krishna Basin level. <coughs> Now, this is only for Karnataka version of Krishna Basin, but what we did is we did for the entire Krishna Basin that I have shown you earlier. And the drainage part that is derived using a simple algorithm, which is referred to as DA algorithm, and you try to derive the drainage pattern, it looks like this. I refer to this as uh, African hairstyle. <laughs> but if you can just uh, zoom this portion, like this small box here, and zoom that portion, you can see the drainage pattern. And we can further zoom this portion to see how detailed drainage pattern we can derive for the entire basin. So that's a very important input as far as hydrology is concerned because we require uh, the drainage pattern from uh, our basin as detailed as possible. Because from this, you can talk about order of the stream and uh, stream density and many other issues that are required for hydrology pattern. So we try to now put all these inputs, that is remote sensing. DAS and DM into hydrologic models. There are large number of models. I will skip through them, but I just mention about one model that I try to demonstrate here using a SWAT model. And this, what we try to do is we try to combine remote sensing for land information. DAS, we try to integrate all of them. DEM for uh, elevation data and a hydrologic model. So you put all of them together, and if you try to through one model, which is a heavy SWAT model. Okay, that is RPU supported, RPU GA supported soil and water assessment tool model. And it looks like this. It's basically the heart of that is the track model. Within that, all the input comes from the uh, remote sensing, DEM, and many other ancillary databases. So from that, we try to combine and use this for calibration as well as validation of the model. So uh, the input that we provide, actually I try to show you for one demo one basin called Malaprava Basin, which is a part of Krishna River Basin, which in itself is about 2,500 square kilometers. And for this basin, we try to derive this drainage pattern, uh, catchment basin, catchment maps, and everything through remote sensing and GIS. Yeah. So the first one that you are seeing here is actually the one that is derived from IRS 3, least 3 data, much with panchromatic data, to get the land use land for information. And Soil power information again from uh, this three data. Then this is the SRTM, this is the elevation data that you are seeing here. And this elevation data is now used with the DH algorithm to derive the drainage pattern. Okay. Once we derive the drainage pattern, we can also identify the 
these are the points where we want to get selected. In SWAT model, they are referred to as four points. So all those four points will be identified. And once we do that, then we can also identify what are the sub-basins. For example, this could be one sub-basin, this could be one sub-basin, and so on, which in SWAT are referred to as hydrologic response units. So all these HRUs can be identified. And over that, if you put our drainage pattern, then we know how the water will flow. So from each component, we try to estimate what is the runoff. We route it through this system and get the runoff at this place. Okay. And that outlet, we compare it to what is actually observed there and see how the model is performing. So we keep on playing around with this model parameters to make sure that the simulated runoff is as closely possible, as closely it is possible to, uh, is as close to the observed data there. And that's referred to as basically calibration. So this is, uh, these are the inputs that are given. What I've shown in a map, here you have shown as numbers here, land use information, soil information, for each surface. So with these inputs, and also the rainfall information, on a daily time scale we have done, but I'm showing you some monthly time scale here. So if we try to use the all this information, then we try to talk about the calibration of the model and when the observed flows and similar flows are very close to each other we say that the model is ready now to be utilized and then we use it for the future prediction and future for given rainfall input which I can expect what is enough. So the core idea of this uh, these inputs of considering remote sensing, GIS and DEM is to talk about water source assessment, use these tools to talk about what is the quantity of water that is likely to be available at a given location, at a given time, and based on that, talk about water source management. So in conclusion, what I can say is that these are some of the uh, very powerful tools that we can try to utilize to model water source as well as planning as well as uh, I'll skip this. Thank you.